I don't know if you're a kite person. In fact, I'm not sure if there's even such a thing as a kite person. But we used to do kites as kids in our backyard, and I think the last time I flew a kite was with my family about 10 years ago. We went to the beach. We got there, and all of a sudden, uh, the water was too cold. Nobody wanted to get in. So suddenly, everybody was like, hey, Dad, what are we going to do now? So we got kites. So we put the kites together, and we flew them for a while. And it was fun, you know, for about, about five minutes. <laughs> then uh, everyone let me know that this was not as good as the boogie boarding we had anticipated. But it kind of reminded me, when I was a kid, we used to uh, make kites out of sticks in the Saturday or Sunday newspaper. It was always interesting to me as we we're putting these things together that we would have, you know, the Saturday funnies uh, flying you know, 50 feet, 70 feet up in the air. I think what struck me most is this transformation that occurred. The transformation that these things that couldn't fly before could be put together in such a way to soar to heights you never would have imagined. It's a similar idea to this that the Bible talks about. The Bible says that we are not to be conformed to the patterns of this world. The worries, the anxieties, the, the ways of thinking, the ways of maybe thinking just about yourself. But instead we are to be transformed. And the word transformed is interesting. The word transform comes from a Greek word, it's metamorpho. Metamorpho, which is where we get the word metamorphosis, which is the same word of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. And in the Greek, this idea is if you want to be transformed, if you want to become the best version of yourself, the energy doesn't come from you. It's not like a caterpillar says, I'm going to change into a butterfly. Instead, you put yourself in an environment where what God's already put in you, that God, something outside of yourself, makes you into a new creature. Behold, all things, the old things have passed away, and all things have become new. But even a butterfly, once he becomes a butterfly, he can't fly, right? He can't fly without the wind, air pressure. Well, Jesus says something similar. He says that just like a butterfly needs something else to transform it from that caterpillar to butterfly, He's talking to a leader one named, named Nicodemus. And he says, Nicodemus, the wind blows wherever it wants. No one's ever seen the wind in the same way most people have never seen God. But that butterfly, even once he's a butterfly, there's two things he needs to fly. He needs to hang on tight, somebody pulling him, and two, the forces of the wind, that invisible wind that allows you to soar to those new heights.
wouldn't it be nice to just fly away? Our band did such a great job with that song, and man, in a year like 2020, it, it would be a fun thing to do. Um, but welcome to Horizon. If you're joining us today on the uh, app or online, so glad you have um, chosen to check out one of our services. Uh, my name is Ryan, and I direct the family ministry here. Um, and today, I'm excited because we're, we're starting a new series called Metamorphosis. And, and this is a series designed to help us as we're all on this journey to becoming the best version of ourselves. And, and I believe it's something we all want, that we all want to push ourselves and stretch and drive to fulfill our potential to its absolute capacity. So it's, it's going to be a fun journey. And, and who would want to stay on a leaf like a caterpillar when you can take to the skies like a butterfly. So let's go back to uh, elementary school and talk about metamorphosis. Well, it was the, the late, great Charles Scholes, the uh, creator of the Peanuts cartoon that brought us um, Charlie Brown and Snoopy. Um, he is quoted as saying, there is no heavier burden than an unfulfilled potential. And Charles lived this that in actuality, um, he was a terrible student. He's failed eighth grade, he struggled in high school, and eventually, though, he stumbled upon cartooning and drawing. And initially, it didn't go well. He, he applied for the school paper and got rejected. In college, he applied to Disney and got rejected there as well. Um, but he stuck to it, and he kept working his craft, and eventually, he stumbled on to the Peanuts cartoon that we're all so familiar with. He found his potential. And that's really what we're talking about in this series. And we're going to do that by looking at this process of metamorphosis. So if you remember back in grade school, um, metamorphosis is from a Greek word called metamorpho. Okay, and metamorpho means that something transforms or it changes shape. And there's two branches to this. There's an incomplete metamorphosis that we see in crickets and grasshoppers, um, where there's a young called a nymph, and it looks a lot like the adult. It eats the same things, it acts the same way, but it doesn't yet have wings. Um, but then there's also full metamorphosis, which is what we'll be talking about. And that happens in butterflies and moths, beetles and bees. And that's this process here, where it goes from an egg there's a larva in the egg, a caterpillar is born, a pupa, and a butterfly. And the larva looks nothing like the adult. It doesn't eat the same things. It doesn't act the same way. It's going to take an amazing process of transformation to take to the skies. Okay, so if you're like me, you're a little critical, and you're probably thinking, okay, thanks, Ryan, for the heads up on the science metamorphosis from grade school. I got that covered. I remember it. Um, pretty cool, um, but not sure it applies. Tell me how it applies to becoming the best version of myself. So go back with me, if you will, uh, to a, a weekend. You're sitting on the couch. You got the sweatpants on, maybe Doritos in one hand, maybe some Oreos. It's not you at your best, but it's the reality some days. And you're flipping channels. And inevitably, you're going to come across an infomercial for getting in shape, right? It's going to teach you how to lose weight. And there is always a uh, stacked and jacked host, right, who has just been pounding Red Bulls and Monster Energy drinks all morning. And he is like, you are going to love this product, right? And he is so excited that he just pulls you in. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you're pretty excited about this new pill or tonic or, or piece of equipment. And I remember, friends, I remember college, and I fell victim to one of these infomercials. I don't know if you remember, but it was called the Abflex, okay? And for the Abflex uneducated, um, it was a triangular-shaped piece of plastic that you would just push against your stomach, okay? There's a little spring in there. And I remember watching that commercial and seeing the before and after pictures and being like, that guy looks incredible. Like, his face has even changed, right? Uh, wasn't the same guy, probably. Um, but... The Abflex, I was so excited, and I order it, $50 and 1994 money. That's a lot of money, okay? Took about three weeks because Amazon didn't exist. But one day, the doorbell rings, and I run down the steps, and there's this huge box with the Abflex, okay? And I break that sucker out, and every morning, 30 minutes a day for three days, I use that Abflex, <laughs> and then I toss it in the corner. 
I experience no transformation except for my bank account. And so often that is what change is like for us. It's, it's frustrating. Well, today we're going to hear from a man who actually lived out transformation. He goes from being a hate-filled, evil man who's hunting down his enemies to, to being a man who's filled with love and compassion and who actually will go on to write a vast majority of the New Testament and the Bible. So he's going to give us a couple of lines of advice on how he does this transition in his life. This is in a book called Romans. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God. So here Paul is giving some advice, okay? And as I alluded to, Paul is a changed man. He has gone from a a hunter of Christians who would persecute and prosecute them to a basically a, a preacher, an early Christian leader. He's undergone a huge transformation. And his advice, it centers on this word transformed. And here's what's really cool. It's actually a word that we've already talked about that that word is in the Greek, the word metamorphu, that Paul is saying, hey, you can be transformed through this process of metamorphosis. It's a very cool thing to think about. And the Roman readers, so that's who this was to, and and Paul was a Roman citizen, they would have been very familiar with this idea of metamorphosis because many of their Greek gods and the Egyptian gods that they studied were shapeshifters. They would change. But what it would have stood out to the Roman ear was the fact that he was using it for the common man or the common woman and saying, hey, you too can change. It's possible. And they would have known Paul. They would have known the drastic change in his life and certainly would have wondered how it came about. Because I think if we're honest, we, we all want that, don't we? Like we all want to change. We all want to grow as people. Um, it's in our DNA. And, and I don't know about you, though. What, what's tough is if I hear about a new book, you know, and it's so exciting. Everybody's reading it. It's changing their lives. And I'll, I'll get that book. Or I'll hear about a new podcast. And I'll start listening to that. Or I'll hear about a new diet or a new workout facility. And I, I jump into all of these attempts to transform. And a lot of times I wind up back at square one. And it's, it's frustrating, right? It's like, Life can feel like a perpetual game of shoots and ladders, where you continue to climb the ladder and you feel like you're doing better, you're doing better, and then you hit a shoot and you're all the way back down to the bottom. You know, and all you're left holding is a $50 ab flex and some guilt and shame, right? Well, Paul is going to speak to that, okay? And we're going to look a little deeper into his advice for some hope at changing ourselves. So let's go back to Paul's words here in uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So he's saying, hey, being conformed is bad. So it's kind of like carbs. You want to stay away from that. Uh, Don't be conformed. Be transformed. Right? And that kind of even like flows. I don't want to be conformed. I want to be transformed. Right? Like put that on a t-shirt. That's a good motto, Paul. Like take my money. Great idea, sir. Um, But then we get to by the renewing of your mind. (laughs) And that's a little confusing, to be honest, right? Like, I don't know what that quite means. Like, is Paul saying, hey, Ryan, you need to like sit cross-legged and, you know, block everything out of your mind and, you know, just hum or something? Like, because... Because that's only going to work for about 20 seconds, Paul. (laughs) And before I know it, I'm going to be thinking about Starbucks or Bunnies or David Hasselhoff. I mean, I don't even know what's going to pop in my mind, Paul. Like, what are you talking about? (laughs) Well, well, friends, what Paul's talking about here, this renewing of your minds, it's not New Age-ish mysticism. It is a renewing of your thoughts. That he's saying, hey, you can renew your mind by renewing your thoughts. And his first piece of advice for us on this is going to be this, to identify the eggs of negative thinking. Identify the eggs of negative thinking. Well, what does that mean? What, what could that be? Well, it's amazing that the metamorphosis process starts with a tiny 
little egg, right? They are minuscule. They're hard to find. But that little egg has amazing potential for both good and evil, for both beauty and danger. That the same little egg, if you don't know what it is, it could grow up to be a, a beautiful butterfly or it could grow up to be a dangerous hornet right? Or an egg could have grown up to have been a dinosaur, or it could grow up to be a beautiful moth. It has amazing potential either way. And our thoughts are like those eggs. Our thoughts have amazing potential for both beauty and danger, that, that a simple thought can lead us to beautiful things like peace and patience and understanding. But a a thought also could lead us to harmful things like anxiety and um, anger and just being stuck in a pattern that there's, there's amazing power in our thoughts. So we've got to identify the eggs of negative thinking. One of the questions that we ask here a lot at Horizon is, how often do you think about what you think about? I know that sounds kind of rhymy, um, but How often do you consider the the record that continues to play in your mind? Do you ever ponder what you ponder? That's another way to say it. Well, it's important to consider. And, And the Bible says this in Proverbs 23. It says, for as he thinks in his heart, so he is. The Bible is quite literally saying, hey, you are your thoughts, like you become your thoughts. It's interesting. One of the, the cool things about this process of metamorphosis too is that when we get to that caterpillar stage, that their DNA strand is amazingly complex. That, that within that strand, there's the full DNA for the caterpillar, but there's also the full DNA for the butterfly. They coexist. The difference is, is that the butterfly DNA is deactivated. It's not turned on. It, it just sits dormant until the right time. And as I think about our thoughts, I think our thoughts are a lot like that butterfly DNA, that we have the power to turn on certain thoughts or turn off certain thoughts, that if we continue <laughs> to turn on the negative thoughts, that just like DNA eventually will produce what it is going to produce, our thoughts will do the same thing in our lives. Thankfully for us, though, unlike the butterfly, we get to choose whether we're going to incubate those eggs or or not incubate those eggs. So just like the butterfly DNA that lies dormant, our, our thoughts have that power in our life, that if we continue to think about negative things and we turn on those thoughts and replay them in our minds, that, that just like that DNA will lead to that conclusion, the thoughts will do the same thing, that, that we have to identify the negative thoughts in our mind. And here's the advice that Paul's going to give us on how to do that. Okay, we're back to those same verses. He's going to say, and do not be conformed to this world. Well, what, what does that mean? Um, well, I think he's talking about our thoughts. He's saying, hey, there are thoughts that, that you can replay in your head that are, man, they, they're negative. They're kind of produced by our culture, our world. Um, so some examples could be this. A thought could be, hey, my value to this world, to my family, comes from my achievements, right? Like if I'm successful, then I have value. Or another conforming thought could be, hey, my value comes from my appearance, right? Like if I look a certain way and present myself a certain way, then I'm going to feel like I have value. Or, or another one could be, hey, money will make me happy. Like I, I, that's where I will find happiness, that these are conforming thoughts, And if you think of them as eggs, like let's play one out. Like imagine you have this egg thought in your head of, hey, uh, my value comes from my accomplishments or my achievements. Um, If you incubate that egg and it grows, well, then before long, you're working 18 hour days, you know, six days a week, which on the surface isn't always bad, but it is bad if it, it comes at the cost of your marriage or it comes at the cost of your family or your health right, that that little egg has potential to grow and to to something that can cause a lot of damage in your life. So that's why we've got to identify them. 
And what's tough, gang, is they are hard to find, okay? So this is a picture of a monarch butterfly egg, and you may not even be able to see it. So we got another slide where it's circled, but it is this little yellow tiny dot. They are so small that you don't just stumble across them. You've got to really look and know where to find them. And our thoughts are like that. They're they're hard to find sometimes. They're kind of hidden in the layers of our psyche. Um, So how do you uncover them? Well, some advice I'd love to give you is to start with some patterns in your life, some of the negative like patterns and actions that maybe you see playing out or patterns and emotions, and try to work your way back to the thought that spawned that. So here's an example, okay, in my life. Like I, I look back at my life and, it, and I think of five or six times where I have this pattern of backing away from challenging situations, okay, where I'm not sure how it's going to go, so I'll just slide out the rear door kind of thing. Um, and, and one of them was my freshman year of college, okay? So I, I had played high school baseball and, and had a pretty good career, and I, I had walked on at the University of Cincinnati, okay? And I go two weeks of walk-on tryouts, um, and, and if you've never seen those, it's crazy. There's 100 guys out there, you know, they're all doing their thing, and at the end of two weeks, there's three of us left. But then I... S- started thinking and my brain started working against me. And I started thinking, well, I went to Madeira, tiny little school. And these guys all went to division one schools. And I'm not as big as that guy, or that guy's a lot faster than me. And what am I going to say to my friends when I do get cut? You know, well, I need to get a job. And I just started coming up with all of these excuses. And at the time I didn't have the maturity to really process that. So I just stopped going. I just quit on a lifelong dream at that point of playing college baseball. And as I've unpacked that since then, I've traced it back from that action of quitting to an emotion of fearing failing. I was terrified of it. And the dream that spawned that though, or the thought, I'm sorry, that spawned that was, I'm not good enough. Like I don't measure up. And now in retrospect, as an adult, that was a record that I allowed to play in my head far too often through adolescence. And when it was incubated and gave birth, it gave birth to something that now I regret. Um, So that's a a good example of why it's important to find these. Okay, so what's the next step? We know we want to transform, not conform. We want to look for these negative eggs in our thinking well, the, the next step's going to sound really easy, okay? But I promise you it's not, okay? The next step is to rest easy on the leaf, okay? Rest easy on the leaf. Well, what does that mean? Like, first off, I, I get easy on the leaf, but what's that R word? Rest, right? Like, we as Americans, we stink at resting, don't we? Like, the quarantine has shown me that more than anything, right? Like, in one day, my my job duties were taken down by 90% for a few weeks to a month. And it, honestly, I struggled to just be, to just rest. Like I could take a walk, I could take a nap, I could take a bath, like, and it was just tough. I, don't, I didn't know how to rest anymore. Well, the second step in this is to rest on the leaf. And here's what I mean, that the, the mama butterfly, the female butterfly, she's very picky about where she lays her eggs. Okay, she doesn't just fly over a field and you know, drop them from her abdomen onto the, the ground below her. She's gonna look for a, a healthy looking plant and she's gonna lay those eggs on a nice yummy looking leaf or a stem because when that caterpillar is born, it's gonna eat that leaf in the process of growing. And, and actually, this is cool, that as it eats the leaf and its belly fills up, that it's triggers a hormonal process that kicks off the metamorphosis. So it's literally, as they eat, it, it triggers metamorphosis. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, well, let's see what Paul might say about resting here. I didn't see the word rest in here, but I think he's going to allude to it. In verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And just to beseech, that's just a word that means invite. I uh, beg, implore, encourage you. Um, And and then we hit therefore. And one of the things I've learned about language over the years is that when there's a therefore, it is always 
there for a reason, right? Like it's about to, to either imply on something that's already happened or allude to something that's going to be said and, and say, this is very important. And in this case, it's talking about the five words by the mercies of God that Paul is saying here, hey, everything I'm about to say, the transforming, the conforming, the renewing your mind, it's all gonna happen by the mercies of God. Like he is the initiator of this change and, and he's gonna be the finisher of this change, okay? That he is like the mama butterfly and he, and he is looking for the perfect place to plant you and, and he's gonna put you on a leaf where you can grow. Well, here's the problem with that is what if you're on a leaf that you don't like, right? Like what if you're on a leaf that's just tough? What if you're on a leaf that just feels like it's on fire right now? And you're like, I don't see God in this at all, Ryan. Like, how did he put me on this leaf? Um, well, I don't know what's going on with your particular leaf, but I, I have been on some leaves that are scary myself. Um, and, and all I can say is that we're not the first people to struggle with this. That in the Bible, there's dozens and dozens of examples of this. And one of them happens in the 8th century BC where God's people are in a, they're in a tough place, okay? The Assyrian Empire is overrunning them. They are, the kingdom's about to fall. Horrible things are happening everywhere. They're doing dumb things. They're messing up big time. Uh, and in the midst of that, though, God's going to speak to them. They're on a leaf they don't like. This leaf is not fun, but he's going to speak to them through a a man named Isaiah. And Isaiah is a prophet. He's just a mouthpiece for God. And he's going to say this. He's going to say, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And friends, I love the imagery of this, that Isaiah is saying, and God's saying through Isaiah, he's saying, hey, I know life feels like a drought right? Like I know it feels like there's nothing to drink. You're thirsty. Other translations of the Bible use the phrase the scorched earth. And I love that because I'm like, that is, that is 2020 in a nutshell, right? That we, we are in a drought. We are in this scorched earth right now. And it's, it's tough. But God's going to also speak gently to them. And look at these words. These words are amazing. He's saying, hey, I will guide you continually and satisfy your soul and drought and strengthen your bones. You're going to be like a watered garden and where the waters don't fail. That friends, often we, we don't know why we're on the leaf we're on. We don't know why God's asking us to kind of fill our bellies with that circumstance, if you will. Um, but often we can't see everything. We can't see what God's doing. So I'm going to try something here with y'all. Okay, so go with me. I'm going to try a little, a little experiment. We'll try to bring a little science to the horizon stage. So we're going to try this. This beach ball is going to represent our lives. And the leaf blower is going to re represent the, the hand of God in our lives. So let's see what we get here. So just like that ball is, is held in place with no hands holding it, with no wires, um, that certainly is what life can feel like, where it's, it's a little scary. But the promise from God here in Isaiah is that he's going to hold us, hold us right in his hands, whether we feel it or not. So we've got to identify the negative eggs. We've got to rest easy on the leaf. And the last step here is we've got to begin to chew on new thoughts, Right, that the thoughts that have been going over and over again in our heads, they're the thoughts that have gotten us to where we are in life right now. So if we want to change, if we want to grow, we're going to have to think new thoughts, right? And I would say the, the key takeaway from today, and if you remember nothing else, remember this, that we've got to think through what thoughts do we need to chew through and just get rid of, and what thoughts do we need to, to chew on and, and replace them with? Okay, the, the larva only leaves the egg and becomes a caterpillar as it chews through 
that actual egg. So what thoughts do we need to chew through? Okay, here's, here's what I would ask you is, what are the half-truths, the full lies, the crazy things that maybe you've been told that you believe and you've been thinking them, or, or maybe the things you've told yourself, but you've seen them play out in your life in negative ways? Um, what are those? And, and here's my encouragement to you. is today's the day to just bite into them, okay? Just take a hunk of that egg and figure out if you just need to spit it out and be done with it, it is just a total lie. It has never served you well. It's not even true. And just spit that out. Or maybe you need to take a bite and and start to really digest it to get to the bottom of that negative thought, right? To, To see what's at the bottom and if it's accurate or not. And this is where I'm a big fan of counseling, that sometimes we can't get to the bottom of our negative thoughts on our own. We need a guide, right? That that God is our guide, but he's also trained and put smart people in our lives that can help us, Um, that I have benefited from counseling myself, helping me understand my thoughts. Um, So I would encourage you to consider that, Um, but also that God has put wise counsel just around us, that we were meant to live in community. Right? We were not meant to be islands. And here's where that gets tough. Is who in your life right now would say, hey, hey, Ryan, you're, you're believing a lie. Like right now there's this half truth that I can tell you're struggling with and it's causing this negative emotion or it's, it's causing this negative action. Like who, who in my life can speak that to me? I know that's a, that's a big ask and a big question, but it, those people only come about through community and connection, right? Like they don't just mysteriously pop up at your door one day. You've got to actually step out courageously to connect. And I know it sounds like sometimes a, uh, an infomercial of our own as we talk about the ways to connect at Horizon um, but it is that important that only through connecting do you, you get wise counsel from people on the race with you. Um, but there's so many ways to connect here in community that we've talked about authentic manhood, which is coming up soon. We've talked about the fact it's going to be a man and his marriage, you know, starting on September 13th. There's women's groups to connect to. There's a whole variety. And, and yeah, you can find info on the web and call in the office, all that stuff. But Here's my invitation is, is come grab me or, or come grab Chad or Drew or John or Tammy. There, there's a lot of us who could personally walk you and connect you to a community where you could become known, where you could have help figuring out the eggs, the thoughts in your brain that maybe you need to chew through and spit out. Okay, but we're not done. We're almost done. But there's one last step that we know that anytime you're replacing a bad habit, you got to replace it with a good habit, right? You can't just have a void there. Um, So Paul actually speaks to that too at the end of verse two. He says, you're going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he's saying, hey, as your mind is renewed, as you transform as you go through this metamorphosis, you'll be able to prove what the, the will of God is. And, and to me, that sounds like a big, a big ask by Paul. Like, I, I don't know what the will of God is, right? Like, that sounds almost crazy. Um, but, but here's how the will of God works. There's the, the sovereign will of God. So, so that's going to happen no matter what. We can't stop it. Things like Jesus going to the cross, that was the sovereign will of God. It was going to happen no matter what once he was born. And then there's the revealed will of God, which is in the Bible. So things like, hey, I want you to be kind. I want you to be humble. I want you to uh, be faithful to your spouse. Um, I want you to be generous. And and the revealed will of God doesn't always happen because we play a part in that. But the the last one is what I would call the the personal will of God for, for our lives. That is, we find this renewing of our mind that our, our thoughts start to become better thoughts. We start to think more like God would think. 
And, and instead of thinking uh, conforming thoughts like my value comes from my achievements, we start to think thoughts like my value comes from being God's child, right? Or, or conforming thoughts like, hey, the, or the thoughts from God of like, hey, the God of the universe knows me completely and he loves me completely. Or good thoughts like, hey, God is going to guide me out of the drought. <laughs> He's going to guide me out of the scorched places in my life if I'll let him. Well, friends, that, that's the promise from God in this. And that, that's the promise of metamorphosis. That, it, that if we will let him, if we will try to identify the way we think and we'll let God renew our thoughts, renew our minds, that we'll start to just think better thoughts on our own. Sort of like if you started trying to eat healthy, where after a while you just start to kind of crave carrots. You don't know why, it just starts to be where, where you go. Um, well, that's the promise from God. And it's never going to happen overnight. You're not going to wake up one day and feel like you're a butterfly. Um, but it's a journey of a lifetime that God offers to us. So I hope you'll consider that today. And we want to thank you for joining us here at Horizon. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Sunglasses like a brand new pair of jeans. I feel like taking chances. I feel a lot like 17. I feel like windows rolling down, new city streets and cabs. I feel like anything can happen, laughing. Take me right back when we were kids. Never thought I'd feel like this. Like when I close my eyes and don't even care if anyone sees me dancing. Like I can fly and don't even think of touching the ground. Like a heartbeat skip. Open page like a one-way trip on an aeroplane It's the way that I feel when I'm with you Brand new Like when I close my